Welcome to the Friday edition of Back to the Bible with Pastor Nat Crawford. The Apostle Paul said that believers are new creations in Christ, but many Christians feel stuck in some of their old ways. Why is that? Author Michael Frazina talks with Pastor Nat about the metamorphosis that Christians can and should experience. Now before we begin, let me remind you that right now your gift to Back to the Bible will go twice as far thanks to a generous challenge grant. But this grant must be met by September 30th, so please make your contribution today. To show our thanks, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward. This new fall edition of Moving Forward features three months of daily devotions to help you stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Request your copy when you give at 1-800-759-2425 or visit us at backtothebible.org. Now let's go to Pastor Nat and his guest, Michael Frazina. Today, I am excited because I've got a special guest, my friend, speaker, author, and founder of the Frazina Group, Dr. Michael Frazina. Michael, thank you for coming on the show today. Sure, Nat. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. God bless you. Um, So great to see you looking so well. I appreciate it. You too. Well, right now I'm working through the book of Galatians for our Back to the Bible radio show, and and it dawned on me, there's a difference between being free, right? Kind of a theme of Galatians, being free. But then there's a disconnect sometimes with living as free, right? We can be free, but not live that way. And I think that's ultimately what you're talking about, being saved, but not reflecting that in our behavior. So I'm just curious from your perspective and what you found by writing this book, why should Christians change and what prevents them from doing so? The fundamental obligation for why a Christian should change is missing out on the blessings of what God wants to give. God created us for his good pleasure. God Mm -hmm. wants to bless us. God has a greater desire to bless you as a believer than your desire to be blessed. Uh, Okay. And, and, And if we could understand and we could put things in a right perspective, you know, people pray, Lord, I need a job or Lord, I need good health or Lord, I need this. Lord, I need to heal this relationship. And, and they pray in a form of desperation, as mm. if somehow, if they just had the secret sauce of prayer, then they could get God's ear, and then God would answer the prayer and bless them. Mm. What they need to understand, God has a greater desire to bless them than their desire to be blessed. But mm. there's a requirement on our part. You know, if you go to Second Peter, and, and look in Second Peter, he tells the believers there, he said, I know you're saved. He had no doubt about the sense of justification, our theological terms, right? Being saved. And he said, but you got to add to your faith these things. Mm. In other words, there's work that we're required to do, not to be saved, but work that is evidence of the growth of our salvation into our sanctification holiness process. And fundamentally, I I think there's been just so much bad teaching through Mm. the the last 30 years or so where... uh, People who have large exposure with large ministries have been teaching biblical fallacy that somehow God is a super sanctified Santa Claus Mm -hmm. uh, that's obligated to make sure that you're healthy, that you're wealthy, that you never struggle, that, you know, and, and it's a heresy of biblical doctrine. And it goes to the parable of the sower of the seed where there's four soils. And it's the third soil that we get the answer to this question. The tares, right? The false wheat grows up with the legitimate wheat. And it looks just like the legitimate wheat, except there's no fruit. And then there's a reason why there's no fruit. The tare is still concerned in this metaphor, right? A a, a believer who's made a profession of faith, but hasn't made this metamorphosis transformation into holiness is struggling with one of three things or a combination of all three, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire of other things. There hasn't been teaching that salvation comes with a cost, and that cost is the forsaking of the things of the world to connect to and to strive to receive the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. I use a metaphor. If you had committed murder and were convicted of murder and you were on death row, and I was the governor, and I commuted your sentence, and I gave you a full pardon, and, and, and just expunged this crime 
so that if you went out on the internet and looked you up on the internet and did a criminal background search, you wouldn't even find that, you know, catalog somewhere on the internet. It would be completely expunged. Okay. So the guards come down, uh, the green mile as it's called, they open up your cell and they tell you you're free to go. Hmm. And somehow over the amount of time that you've spent in that solitary loneliness, the bondage of that prison cell, you become accustomed to the comfort of that cell. So with the door wide open to freedom, you choose to stay on death row. And the guard finally says, well, okay, look, you're free to go. And I've got other work to do. Anytime you want to leave, just come out and you can go. And Paul talks about the idea, again, of the liberty of a believer having been saved. It's not the freedom to sin. It's the freedom from sin. From sin and so, the, again, there are just foundational, fundamental principles, spiritual growth and development that many, many, many pastors and churches have just neglected to teach. And so we have people who, I, I love Jesus. I, I want to serve Jesus. I, I, I want the blessings of it. And they don't understand that they're either keeping themselves in a self-contained prison cell of bondage mm -hmm. uh, or they have yet to give up the participation of desires of the things of this world, deceitfulness of riches, caring for other things. Uh, and so they haven't gone through this mental transformation that Paul talks about in Romans 12, the power of the Holy Spirit to renew our mind to change our thinking, to change our emotions, to change our habits, to change our behavior. And, and that's a, a progress in which we have to participate. We have to do the work in those areas as Peter exhorts believers to do in Second Peter. Hmm. To your faith, add virtue, moral excellence. My goodness, the, how lazy it is to just dabble with sin and allow uh, a sexual sin or a pride sin or a gossip sin or a glutton sin to come back in your life and say, well, God understands, and so I'll just ask for forgiveness again. And yes, he'll forgive you. But my goodness, what a lower level of spiritual growth and development that is to just live off the crumbs of the table when the Lord mm -hmm. has prepared a banquet feast for you if you are willing to come in. Right. That, that's the book. Right. That's the premise. That's the, <laughs> the, the main core of, of right. this element right. of ministry. There's something you said earlier, you talked about lordship and salvation, and what I've come to discover as a pastor, and probably you've discovered this as well, is a lot of Christians today, uh, they've been, um, I guess, fed the wrong the wrong Kool-Aid, right? The wrong gospel. Hey, the gospel says health, wealth, and prosperity. The gospel says, hey, uh, grace abounds, so go sin. Hey, guess what? The gospel says it's all this plus, you know, the, the simplicity of the gospel plus some extra works. In other words, we've been taught a false gospel, and it completely wrecks our mind and our thinking, and so our behavior doesn't change. So I'm curious. I've heard you speak a lot about this notion of how our thinking impacts our beliefs, which impacts our behavior. How does the Word of God influence that process? Great question. So... You know, the Bible talks about striving to enter into that narrow gate, right? So it, it, there's a clear sense in which I have to be actively participating and disciplining myself into daily rituals that ensure that I keep abiding in Christ. Remember, we're a branch that's been grafted in. If, if you can graft a branch in, uh, you can graft a branch out. You can cut a branch off. And... So, you know, this goes to, to the age-old idea of the, the phrase, uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, I prayed a prayer, uh, at, at confessing my heart to Jesus, and so now I have eternal security. I'm always going to be saved. You know, and uh, there are verses of Scripture that seem to support that, and there are verses of Scripture that seem to say, you are saved by God's grace through faith. And there's an abiding nature where every day there's a recommitment to that relationship and that abiding relationship. So mm -hmm. there's a process that you can, you can create as a habit and that habit then becomes a daily ritual where you wake up in the morning and you're thankful and give God gratitude and thankful that you have another day to live your life on this earth. The struggles in this life are real, 
Yet God calls and empowers us to keep growing and going. And to help you along the way, we'd like to send you a copy of the fall issue of Moving Forward, our brand new three-month daily devotional. It's our way of saying thank you for your contribution to our September Challenge Grant. This generous grant of $130,000 is all about bringing people back to the Bible, people who live in a culture of despair. But with your help, we can continue to proclaim God's message of hope. So please call or go online today to make your gift and request your copy of Moving Forward. Remember, your gift will go twice as far thanks to the Challenge Grant. But the deadline is coming up soon, so call today. Here's the number, 1-800-759-2425. 1-800-759-2425. Or if you prefer to give online, visit us at backtothebible.org. Backtothebible.org. Now, let's return to Pastor Nat Crawford and special guest, Michael Frazina. Look, if, if we were going to make our body really healthy and you were to hire a, a, an exercise physiology coach, the first place they start working is on your core. So we go to the core spiritually. What are the core principles? What are the core values that you're going to incorporate into your life? What are you fundamentally going to believe about what the scripture says you need to be doing as a believer, both to become saved and then what you're supposed to do after you're saved? And Paul spends a good deal of time on both of those. It isn't an either or, it's an and. You know, he says, mm-hmm. you were Gentiles. You were lost with no hope until the mystery of God was revealed that salvation was for the Gentile too. And so the circumcision isn't the physical outward circumcision of the cutting of the skin, but it is a metaphorical circumcision where you die to self, self desires, self wants, self ambition. You put that flesh man to death Mm -hmm. so you can rise and walk in a newness of life in Christ. Now, who's teaching that message today? Turn on any television uh, ministry and, and, and go through the litany of Christian television cable stations and YouTube ministry stations. What gospel are you hearing? You know, are you hearing a gospel of repentance? Are you hearing a gospel of redemption? Are you hearing a gospel of walk worthy of Christ within you? Are you hearing a gospel of holiness? No, you don't hear that. And if you do, it's just Mm -hmm. very rare. And it's a snippet somewhere muddled in between something that's supposed to make you happy. And uh, then we take the offering and and Mm -hmm. we're done. And so we're faced with a a challenge of, of spiritual truth that develops in you that you commit to and that you practice every day. So you get up every day having created this desire to connect with the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to the disciples in John 14, I'm going away, but don't worry, I'm going to send another to you. The Greek word for another is a line, and it means identical. So if you had rented a, a, a luxury car and you go to pick it up and you're expecting a Beamer or BMW or something, and they show you a Ford Escort, you'd say, wait a minute, this isn't the car I reserved. Right? I mean, it's got four tires and it's got the wheel and it's got an engine, but this isn't like what I was expecting. When Jesus used the word Alon for the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. it's also what gives the Holy Spirit presence and identity in the Godhead. If the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus mm-hmm. and Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit has to be God too. And sadly today too, we don't have a lot of consistent, accurate biblical teaching about the Holy Spirit. Some denominations don't want to talk about the Holy Mm. Spirit at all. Some denominations want to talk that the power of the Holy Spirit to transform your life was a first century uh, dynamic. And now we have the scripture and we only need the scripture and we don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. You know, so Mm. again, we don't have a consistency of, of a solid biblical basis of understanding how to live my life in metamorphosis, how to live my life transformed. And it starts with you understanding as a believer that there is work that you do daily. You commit to that work daily. You walk worthy as a saint of the calling of Christ in you daily. Uh, So that means you're reading your word. You're fellowshipping with believers. uh, You you are putting to death the flesh, this old man that Paul talks about. You're putting on the new man. Uh, Again, he, he writes about this in Ephesians very clearly about the separation, about death, to the flesh, dying to self, 
rising and walking in a newness of life in this resurrected, transformed, metamorphosed state. And then he tells you specifically what you're supposed to do. So we get these beautiful passages in Ephesians where he goes through all these personal relationship dynamics. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Go ahead and preach that today and find out how popular that message is. Go ahead, guy. <laughs> die, die to yourself. Love your wife as Christ would love her. What would Christ be like? What would life be like for your wife if she was married to Jesus instead of being married to you? Parents, don't provoke your children to anger. Parents, you know, raise your children up. And children, how about being obedient and honoring to your parents? Because it's a commandment that comes with a promise, you know. And then, this is a really heavy one, right? Masters, slave owners, real slave owners mm. to real mm. slaves. Masters, how to treat your slaves. Slaves, how to be faithful and obedient to your slave owner master. I mean, this mm. is transformational stuff. This is radical stuff. And where do we hear it today? Who's teaching this today? And then we wonder why Christians make a profession of faith. They go forward. They pray a prayer. They go and get baptized. And then poof, with a magic wand and pixie dust, life is supposed to be magical and transformational. And there's no effort of connecting to mm. the scripture and practicing the scripture. Uh, what makes this life, as your this question gets to the point to, I now live in freedom. I live in liberty, but I live in the blessing of God. I also live in a mind that's open to allow God to bring anything into my life that's filtered through his will for my life. And if, it, if it's a part of that is going to be trials and difficulties and illness and a loss of a job and a brokenness of a relationship, then if God can keep me from these things, which he has in my life, but there have been a host of other trials that have come into my life. I don't want anybody to think that I've lived a rose-colored life. Uh, we had a prodigal son walk out of our life for four years. We didn't know where he was. We didn't know if he was alive. We're going out to church one Sunday night at about 6.30, and the front doorbell rang, so I had to come from the back of the house where the garage was to the front of the house. I opened the door. There's this filthy, dirty, smelly, bearded, haggard, older looking man and as soon as I opened the door I mean this the smell just caught me and in the midst of that he said dad if you still love me will you help me because I think if you don't help me tonight I'm going to die and that was a realization that my son was standing in front of me wow uh, my wife has been through a life-threatening uh, illness and and a cancer and a cancer recovery uh, mm -hmm. I had a cancer and I'm a cancer uh, survivor uh, we had military deployments um, my wife prayed uh, several times through this, the word of knowledge of the Holy Spirit that I was in trouble and we were able to reconnect. And this was prior to the internet. So you had to make you know, long distance calls. And she said, you know, I, I felt the need to pray for you on this particular day at this particular time where you were in the time zone. Were you in trouble? And it said, yes. And literally prayed me safe through what could have been life ending uh, situations with the military. And uh, so, you know, he sees you from these things or he sees you through them, but he is always faithful. And when we go through the trial and we come through the other side, if part of it is for our growth and our, our, our resiliency and our toughness, but it also gives us the ability to witness into the lives of people who are hurting and say with great legitimacy, I know what you're feeling. I've mm -hmm. been there. And then real ministry happens in the empathic compassion of the working of the spirit. Uh, and we have legitimacy to talk to hurting, broken people because we've experienced that same pain. Wow. And I well, know you've experienced uh, with serious mm -hmm. illness with a child and there can't be anything more hurting for a parent than to have to, to just suffer through. And we had a, a son where we labored at the bedside of an ICU with him septic and dying and uh, at 14 years old and just praying feverishly at the bedside, Lord, if you're going to take him, Thy will be done. If you're going to give him back to us, you know, thy will be done. And the Lord was gracious and he gave him back to us. Um, right. So, you know, I know where you've been and I know where you still are. And, and so God bless you in that as well. Oh, thank you, brother. Well, unfortunately, our time is up, but I, I just want to um, kind of summarize this. So, I mean, again, if, if you're if you're watching this or listening today, you have not uh, picked up this book, Metamorphosis, I would encourage you to, because this is a real problem today. So many people are experiencing Jesus Christ, 
but something is amiss, and you're not taking those steps to grow in your faith. You're not taking the steps to really change, to allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. You're not renewing your mind daily, and Dr. Frazina has has said this so eloquently here and in other places. What we think about dramatically impacts what we believe, and what we ultimately, ultimately believe will impact how we live and how we behave. And that's why this makes such a difference, because Jesus Christ came not just to save your soul, but to change your life. The world will see the difference that Christ has made. Perfection? Never. We all struggle with sin. But I promise you, God has something great for you, but we have to be willing to go through the struggle, just like the butterfly has to struggle through and break out of that cocoon so his wings can can spread and fly. And then people say, wow. Look at that. That's what God does with us. He transforms us from sinners to saints, from corpses to masterpieces. And he says, wow. And when we do that, the world will say, wow, as well. Michael, there are people who are going to say, okay, great. I want to get the book. I want to learn more about uh, Michael. Where do they go? Where do they get uh, a book? And where do they find out more about what you are doing with the Frazina Group? Sure. Uh, Amazon uh, has copies, uh, easy to obtain. They also, there's an ebook version uh, in Amazon, uh, in Kindle, and Apple Books as well. And the other thing I want to, to leave folks with is, look, God has said already that he has perfected us. And Paul said, I'm not yet what I am to be, right? So there was mm. this constant sense of the journey, working toward becoming, you know, what God has for us. But in potential, we've, we're already there. We just have to go through the change process, just like the, the butterfly does, to get to this place. And it's real, and you can do it. And there are ways in which you can live with a sense of joy and peace that I know so many Christians are desiring and feel lacking in right now. But it all starts, as Nat just said, nothing changes till your thinking changes. Mm-hmm. You need to pray. And ask the Lord, the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to help you change whatever thinking is still tied to the things of this world. And ask him to renew your mind, as Paul wrote in in 12.2, that you can present yourself then holy as a living sacrifice. And discover God's gifts that he's given to you. And start putting those gifts into practice and service for others. And developing a heart and a mind of gratitude and thankfulness, which is totally contrary to the American culture today, which is a culture dominated with self and living for self and getting for self. And I'm not getting mine and this entitlement lie that Satan is using to destroy our country. No, the Bible says, die to yourself. Love your neighbor as you loved yourself. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The greatest of the two commandments. Live with a mindset of thankfulness, of gratitude. Go out and do a random act of kindness for a total stranger. All of these things are the strategy and the living uh, tools that we teach and, and offer to people that as they think about them, and their emotions change and they start practicing them to cultivate the habits and then they wake up every day walking worthy of of the calling of Christ within them. They put these strategies to practice every day in the way they think about and how they ultimately behave and then life is lived the way God intended for us. He says, I've come that you have life and have that life more abundantly. And, And I'm offering to all believers today the opportunity to live in that promise. He has promised you life and life more abundantly and it's Mm -hmm. just there for you to take because he has a greater desire to bless you than you desire to be blessed engaging god's word transforming lives you're listening to back to the bible now as we wrap up Let me remind you that right now, your gift to Back to the Bible will go twice as far thanks to a generous challenge grant. But this grant must be met by September 30th, so please make your contribution today. To show our thanks, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward. This new fall edition of Moving Forward features three months of daily devotions to help you stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Request your copy when you give at 1-800-759-2425. Thank you for listening today. And as always, 
Stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word.